Hey everybody, this is Pastor John, and uh, it's good to be with you again by virtue of the interweb. Um, I believe I've got a word for you. I was talking to my daughter Kira a couple weeks ago, and she was asking me my opinion on the Nephilim, and we started researching that a little bit. And I believe that this message, it kind of springboarded off of this into the message that I've got for you tonight. Um, we're going to talk about giants and how to face them. And so hopefully we'll look at a little bit of the, the theology and the interesting, you know, all these kind of unusual, you know, giants and Leviathan and behemoth and all these different kind of things that you see in the Bible that are unusual have always been appealing to me because um, it's not things you see every day. And the concept of, you know, the sons of God and the daughters of men, which we're going to get to in a minute, it's always been fascinating to me. So I hope that uh, it's just as fascinating to you tonight, but I also hope to give you some practical word that you can take out with you and that you can use in daily life. But let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray right now that we would hear your word today. God, I believe today is a new day. Yesterday doesn't exist, Father, but today is a new day for new things in the kingdom of God. Father, I pray that today, those who are new in you, Father, I pray that they will be like newborn babes, that they will crave the milk of your word. And Father, I pray that they will grow, that they will receive it, Father, that they will mature in you, Father, that they will grow to become the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, Lord. And I pray for those who have been following you, following the way for years, Lord. I pray that whatever word that we have tonight, Father, that it'll be as though it's for the very first time that we hear it, Lord. That it will be a fresh word, that it will be a new word, that it will be a powerful word as your word is, God. And that it will change our lives, Lord. And I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Just wanted to get started big here. Amen. I'm going to start by reading Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4. I'm reading from the New English translation of the Septuagint. And uh, the Septuagint is kind of like twice removed from the original. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Torah, you know, the law, the prophets, the poems, the histories. It was the Greek translation that was made sometime between the Old Testament and the New Testament being written. And so when Jesus walked the earth, when the Apostle Paul walked the earth, when the disciples of Jesus walked the earth, one of the things they would have probably had access to would have been the Septuagint. As a matter of fact, we have strong evidence that whenever the guys in the New Testament would quote from the Old Covenant, uh, that the wording indicates that they were quoting from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. You know, this Hebrew scriptures that was originally written in Hebrew and was translated into Greek at some point between the Old and the New Testament. And so I thought it was kind of neat to, uh, you know, it's, I always enjoy trying different Bible versions just to see how they say, you know, it's like saying the same thing a slightly different way. Although some of them you do have to be careful because they say a completely different thing a slightly different way. But anyway, Genesis 6, 1 through 4 from the New English Translation of the Septuagint. It says, and it came about when humans began to become numerous on the earth that daughters also were born to them. Now, when the sons of God saw the daughters of humans, that they were fair, they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. And the Lord God said, my spirit shall not abide in these humans forever because they are flesh, but their days shall be 120 years. Now the giants were on the earth in those days and afterward when the sons of God used to go into the daughters of humans when they produced offspring for themselves. Those were the giants that were of old, the renowned humans. Um, now there are Christians who believe that this is talking about angels, that the sons of God were angels who came down and cohabited with human women and produced an offspring and the production, the, the result of that, the product of that was called giants. The Hebrew word there is Nephilim. And uh, we're going to look at that a little bit. It's interesting because when you look at Christian history, church history, there are some people who believed that Genesis 6 was talking about fallen angels. And I'm going to name some of them for you. Justin Martyr, uh, Eusebius, who wrote a history of Christianity, a history of the church. Um, within the first few hundred years. Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and other early Christian writers believed that this was talking about angels. 
Um, so let me read this to you. Genesis 6, 2, it calls them the sons of God. Now, the reason that a lot of people believe that's talking about angels is because some of the only other places that this is mentioned in Scripture is Job 1, 6, Job 2, 1, and Job 38, 7. And what it says, it says, One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And then it also says on another day, this is chapter two of Job, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And then Job 38, seven says, while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And in a lot of modern translations, they are so convinced that the sons of God in these three passages of Job mean angels that they've actually translated it as angels, when the morning star sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. And so there's indications that these sons of God in Job are actually talking about messengers of God or angels. And so a lot of people apply that to Genesis 6. So let's look at this. Can angels enter into physical relationships with humans? That's a good question, because when you read Mark 12, 25, Jesus said, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But the thing about Mark 12, 25, it suggests that angels don't marry, but it's not talking about fallen angels. It's talking about angels who were in the presence of the Lord. And so the idea is if these angels so choose or so chose back then to take on fleshly bodies that they could cohabit with women and produce these strange and unusual offspring. And if this sounds like something from Dr. Moreau's Island or whatever the name of that is, if it sounds like some crazy sci-fi, there's some sci reality going on right now. If you do some research, there are scientists who desperately want to do hybrids between like chimps or apes and humans. They want to create hybrids. They're already trying to create hybrids among different kind of species of animals. They're not animals that could mate together, but in a lab, they're taking cells from this animal, cells from that animal, and trying to uh, splice the genetic code together and see what kind of crazy concoction they can come up with. You know, you could call it playing God, and I don't think it's a really good thing. I think it's a sign of the times that we're in, but that's a whole other message. Um, but listen, there's two main passages in the New Testament that talk about fallen angels in this context. And I'm going to read them to you. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, and then there's, you would say dot, 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 because we're in the mid-sentence here, but I wanted you to get Second Peter 2, verse 4. Um, one version says in Second Peter verse 4, it says, He cast them into Tartarus, into bonds of nether darkness, held there for judgment. And then Jude 1, 6 it also says, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Now there is a parallel. There's five things that I see when I look at Second Peter 2 and when I look at Jude chapter 1, because there's only one chapter in Jude, verse 6. There's five parallels. Number one, they both speak of angels. Number two, they speak of the wrongdoing or the sin of those angels. Uh, Peter says they sinned. Jude says that it was not having kept their first domain or left to their own dwelling. Number three, they both speak of chains for these angels being bound in chains. Number four, they both speak of darkness for those angels. And number five, they both speak of a future judgment for those angels. And so there's five parallels between Second Peter and Jude that lead me to believe that they're both talking about the same situation from two vantage points and that you get different details depending on which one of those verses that you read. Let's look at those five things real quick. Number one, they're both about angels. Peter tells us they sinned. Jude tells us what the sin was. He says they did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. 
If 2 Peter and Jude are about the same incident, Jude seems to be elaborating or describing the sin that Peter mentioned. Just Peter said they sinned. They did wrong. And Jude is telling you what it is. Um, let me read some different translations of this and see if it sounds like something that happened in Genesis 6. See if you can um, see a connection in that as you listen to this. Uh, of course, the King James says they kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Uh, the angels, these are just, I'm not going to tell you exactly what versions these are. You could look that up later, but it says the angels who did not keep their own domain. The angels who did not keep their own position. The angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them. Those angels who were not content to maintain the dominion assigned to them. They did not keep their kingdom. Those who did not keep their own principality. The second phrase of that, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, abandoned their assigned place, deserted their own home. They left their own abode. It does sound kind of like Genesis 6 to me. It sounds kind of like what they went. There was an estate. There was a dominion. There was a, an area, a realm of existence that they were in. They were considered sons of God. They were considered messengers of God. And they came down and they did this strange and perverted thing with the daughters of men. Um, now listen to this. Peter uses the term hell or Tartarus. And uh, one commentary says Tartarus was thought of by the Greeks as a subterranean place lower than Hades where divine punishment was meted out and so regarded in Israelite apocalyptic as well. This is actually uh, not from a commentary. It's from the BDAG. Uh, a lot of people call it the BDAG. It's a standard Greek lexicon of the New Testament and ancient Greek. And so the idea is that they sent them in this terrible place. God punished them because what they did was something terrible and awful. Um, so they talk about angels. They talk about the wrongdoing. They both speak of the chains, the darkness. Now listen to this. Peter calls it chains of gloomy darkness. And Jude calls it chains eternal under darkness. And then finally, they both speak of a future judgment for those angels. Let me give you one more aspect of this. In 2 Peter 2, in the Greek word for word, if you tried to read it word for word, translating it, translating it into English, it's going to say angels... Having sinned, not spared, but in chains of gloomy darkness, having cast down to Tartarus, delivered for judgment, being kept. And then Jude 1.6 in the Greek would say something like this, unto the judgment of the great day in chains eternal under darkness he keeps. And so these both sound like the same instance. Another reason that they sound like they're connected to Genesis is because one of these guys also goes right into the story of the flood, which in Genesis 6 takes place right after the sons of God encounter the daughters of men. And so Peter and Jude have five things. Let me just one more time run through them for you. The five things in common, they both talk about angels. They talk, talk about the sin of those angels. They both talk about the chains that those angels are bound in now. They talk about the darkness of where those angels are and they talk about the future judgment of those angels. Jude and Peter, now here's something that's interesting. Jude and Peter both got their more flushed out version of the story because you don't get all this when you read Genesis 6. But it is believed that they got their flushed out, their more thorough version of the story from a book called the Book of Enoch. Jude actually quotes from the book of Enoch in verses 14 and 15. I'm going to read this to you. He says that um, Enoch, the seventh generation for Adam, prophesied saying, See, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all the deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, Enoch also ties in this concept. Instead of just calling them angels, Enoch calls them the watchers. And this idea was that God appointed some of his angels, some of his, and you could call them offspring of God or sons of God because he created them as spiritual beings to do his will. And he appointed them to watch over the nations. And then he appointed himself. He chose Israel. You know, we always talk about Israel is God's chosen people. That's all through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. 
Israel is God's chosen people. One aspect of that, according to the book of Enoch, is that he chose other entities that were under his authority that were going to watch over these other nations of the world. And then he kept Israel specifically for himself as his chosen people. But these watchers fell into sin. They came down, they committed sin, and they fell from their point of authority and their domain that they were in. Deuteronomy 32, 8 says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundary for the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. Now listen, that last phrase, I know we're going through a lot of stuff fast, but I believe we're getting somewhere. So I ask you to just keep bearing with me, keep, keep traveling, keep training and trucking along with me. Doot, doot. Anyway, uh, the last phrase, this, it says, for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. In the Dead Sea Scrolls and other translations, it translates that the sons of God. In another place, the Septuagint, it translates it as angels of God. And there's a guy named Dr. Um, Heiser, Dr. Michael Heiser, who did a paper on this years ago. He's written books since then where he talks about this scripture. He says the idea is he, he apportioned all these nations according to these entities that he created to watch over them. And then Israel is his own inheritance. And so the idea, look at this, the Lord set up boundaries for the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God or according to the numbers of the angels of God. And so each one of these boundaries, each one of these nations had a watcher, had an entity, a being that was under God's authority to watch over it. But then it says the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob his allotted inheritance. This is going to sound far-fetched, but some people believe that this is a council in heaven. It's almost like you could say that they are little g-gods that are ruling or were supposed to rule and reign to be rulers and authorities and dominions and powers under the authority of Almighty God, but they blew it. They're still um, powerful creatures, even though, according to uh, Jude and, and Peter, the ones that actually went down with the and committed sin with the women are in chains of darkness. There are still these dominions and these powers, because that's why in Ephesians, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers and dominions. And um, listen to this. The authors of the Old Testament, this is from the paper that Michael Heiser wrote. The authors of the Old Testament affirmed the existence of plural Elohim, that is the word that they translate into God. While they also asked, who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Precisely because they already knew that the Lord, or as we said last week, yod heh vav -Hey, yod heh vav -Hey, that's the letters that spell out the sacred name of God. They knew that yod heh vav -Hey is an Elohim, but that only he is omnipotent, preexistent, and omniscient. In other, and so it's no conundrum for the people of Israel to affirm that the word Elohim in their language described actual beings that the Lord or yod heh vav -Heh, had created who were members of his council while knowing that none of these Elohim were truly comparable to him. And so this idea was that he picked these, um, he created these angels, these messengers, these Elohim that were going to rule the nations but rule them under him. And you know what? They blew it. They messed up. He sent his only begotten son into this world. And it says in the book of Psalms that his son, his begotten, is now going to be the one who will rule them with a rod of iron. It only takes one Jesus, one Yeshua HaMashiach. It only takes one Messiah to take the place of all these beings that were going to rule all these uh, parts of the earth. Whenever he comes back, he is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. That's not just talking about earthly kings and earthly lords, but he is going to rule over those that were supposed to rule over the nations. He is going to rule over the nations. Now listen, I love this because he created all these creatures, all these supernatural beings to rule over the nations. But then it says the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. Now, this, listen to this. Let's talk about this inheritance thing. Because according to the New Testament, as a matter of fact, let me get my, my Bible here and let me get this out. Because according to the New Testament, we have received an inheritance. And it's in Ephesians. Now, I want to pull this out and look at this real quick. In Ephesians chapter 1, 
And this Bible's kind of marked up, as you can see. I don't know, I've probably showed you this before, but um, Ephesians is one of my favorite books. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. This is just a little rabbit hole. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of us, um, try to be theologians and try to come up with doctrine. And we get these books, take, take Ephesians chapter one, for example, and you can just break every verse of the first 14, 15 verses of Ephesians chapter one is doctrinal and deep theological truths. But what we forget about sometimes is the passion behind when Paul actually spoke these words for the first time. Because what he did, when he starts to pray, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And he continues doing this. It's about the first 14, 15 verses of chapter one. And what we look at is this great, you know, each one of these phrases is a great theological truth. When he prayed it, he basically, in the Greek, these first, well, let me just tell you, I keep saying 14 or 15, from verse three all the way down to verse 14 is one long sentence in the original Greek. In other words, whenever he got ready to say, blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and say all these things, it was like all this is just one great cry of praise to God for all the things he's done for us through his son, Jesus. Then it's almost like he's going to speak for 14 verses without taking a breath. He's like, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he just goes into this. And it is a song and a prayer of praise. And when we're looking at the theology, when we're looking at the doctrine, we don't want to forget that there is praise involved. It is spirit inspired. It is spirit empowered. It's not just the letter, but it's the spirit. It's got to be both. It's got to be the word and the spirit working together in our lives. Amen. So I hope that helps somebody. But let me look at this. He says, well, I should have brought my readers. Listen to this. Um, whoo, Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined. That word chosen there in the Greek, it says we have been chosen for inheritance. We have been chosen for inheritance. And it's referring to the Old Testament where they would choose by lot. We've been chosen by lot for inheritance. <clears throat> now, the big question that comes up is we've been chosen for inheritance. That means we're chosen we're supposed to be God's inheritance because he says that these people are my portion. Israel is my portion. And so now under the new covenant, everybody who's found in Messiah is his portion. And we've been chosen um, to be God's inheritance. We're his treasure. The other way of looking at that is the flip, the opposite side. We have been chosen. God has chosen us in order to give us himself, <clears throat> his goodness, his blessings as our inheritance. In other words, are we an inheritance that God has inherited for himself or is God an inheritance that we have inherited for ourselves? And when you look at the scripture, you're going to kind of get both. Deuteronomy 4.20, these verses make it sound like that we're his inheritance. <clears throat> he says, uh, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his inheritance. Deuteronomy 7.6. He says that um, out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, you are his people, his treasured possession. Deuteronomy 14, 2, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. And it goes on and on. Deuteronomy 26, 18, Psalm 135, 4, which says, again, Israel, his treasured possession. And then, of course, in the New Testament, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that you should a God's special possession that you should declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. And so you've got these passages that say we are his treasure. We are his inheritance. We belong to God and he treasures us so much for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We are his inheritance. He treasures us and he loves us. <clears throat> but on the other hand, he is our inheritance. And when you've got God as your inheritance, You've got everything you need. Genesis 1, uh, 15, 1. The Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 119, 57. You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your word. Psalm 142, 5. I cry to you, Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. And it goes on and on. Jeremiah 10, 16. Lamentations 3, 24. And so these passages, you say, well, which is it? Is God saying that we're his treasured possession and he treasures us and we're his inheritance? Or is God saying that we have inherited him and he's our treasured possession and he's our inheritance? It's both. It's both at the same time. It's like a marriage. It's like a covenant. When you enter into the covenant, you inherit everything good about the other party of that covenant. They inherit everything good about you. And you're like, well, there's nothing good about us except that he has sent his son. Jesus said that he came to give us life and give it more abundantly. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. First Corinthians said, yeah, we were doing all these things that made us not a treasured possession, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God, he has made you his treasured possession. So don't ever forget it. Walk in that every day of your life. Amen. Praise the Lord. That'll preach. Hallelujah. Uh, listen to this. Those rulers and authorities, now that those watchers have fallen, God wants to show off what he's doing through you to those rulers and authorities. It says that first he raised up God, see, or he raised up Jesus, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And so God wants to show off his son to those rules, those authorities, all those things that were supposed to do the right thing and now they've messed up. Now he is showing off to them. He's gonna show off, it says in another place, that his manifold wisdom is gonna be manifest through the church to those rulers and those authorities. God is showing off what he is doing through Jesus Christ and through your life. Hallelujah, amen. But let's get back to those giants. Listen to this. There were giants in the land. <clears throat> the sons of the Anakims or the Anakites were a great and tall people. Deuteronomy 128, Deuteronomy 2, 10 and 11, Deuteronomy and verse 21, Deuteronomy 9, 2, Joshua 11, 21 and 22. It goes on and on. Their forefather, Anak himself, was a giant. Um, Numbers 13, 33, it says, we also saw the Nephilim there, the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Um, and you say, well, maybe that's hyperbole. Maybe, you know, we were like grasshoppers next to them. Maybe that's this is an exaggeration. They were a big muscular people. They work out, they eat right. And we come in there, we've been in the desert for 40 years. And so we look at them and we're like, gum. they are really um, in tip top shape. They're fit, man. They are really fit. They use Fitbit and everything. But now here's the height of a king mentioned, King Og. Deuteronomy chapter three, verse 11. King Og of Bashan was the last survivor of the great Rephaites. Uh, and I'm trying to pronounce that. I'm not doing a really good job. Anyway, his bed was made of iron and was more than 13 feet long and six feet wide. And at the time this was written, it says it can still be seen in the Ammonite city of Rabbah. Dude's bed was over 13 feet long. Guy was not short. 
The guy was not short at all. There's some comparisons that I want to put up and I'll probably add, edit that later. And so right now you should be seeing some comparisons that are showing like an average um, Israelite dude back in that day. And then maybe you're going to see Goliath and uh, how he looked during that time. But then you're also going to see a representation of Og, King Og, who actually makes Goliath look small. And uh, I think there was another chart that I wanted to show you that shows like an average NBA ball player, you know, Michael Jordan or one of these guys that shows you an average guy than an average NBA ball player. And then it's going to show you, I think Goliath was the next one. But if it shows you King Og, Goliath had a reputation for being over nine feet tall. King Og's bed made of iron was more than 13 feet long. So let's say that it's a foot or two longer than he is. He could be 11 or 12 feet tall, easy. That is a giant, my friends. And so there were giants in the land. And so let's go to Jul uh, Goliath. Goliath, <laughs> he comes out in July. Anyway, let's look at Goliath for a few minutes because I want to look at how to face those giants because it's so intimidating when you hear about a dude, you know, a dude that's five, 11 is intimidating to me. I'm a short guy. But if you see somebody who's 6'2", six 6'6", six six, you know, 6'8", oh my Lord, when's it going to stop? And then you get to Goliath. He's over nine feet tall. But he faced something he didn't expect. And his name was David, a little shepherd boy. Listen to this. Goliath was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and had bronze armor. The chest armor alone weighed about 125 pounds. That's heavier than some of y'all watching this. Uh, he carried a bronze sword strapped to his back. You think about these guys in the movies, they've got the sword strapped to their back and they're about to enter into battle and they're like, they reach back and you know, and they start fighting. Or maybe the ninja guy, he's got two of them and he reaches out. Goliath carried one of those that was strapped to his back like that. Um, it says his spear was so big that the iron spearhead alone weighed more than 15 pounds. That's going to kill somebody. A soldier always walked in front of Goliath carrying his shield. He was the Philistine's secret weapon. And so they had to protect him. But I don't know how secret you can keep an over nine foot tall weapon. Um, on the other hand, you have David. David was a boy, not a man. David was a shepherd, not a warrior, not a soldier. David was a shepherd, a singer, a songwriter, and a poet. If you ever watch any of the music stations, if you ever watch any of the music stations on TV, you find out that singer-songwriters are usually not warriors. Uh, David was the youngest member of his family, so David was the baby of the family. But David knew how to use what was in his hands. David, he had a sling, and when it was in his hand, he knew how to use it. David had a harp, and when that harp was in his hands, he knew how to use it. David had a shepherd's staff, and when that shepherd's staff was in his hands, he knew how to use it. There's two things I want you to get from that. Be yourself and use your stuff. Be yourself and use your stuff. God has called you. He has set you apart. He has called you individually to do a particular work in this day and age, in this generation. You're called and you can't do it by being somebody else and you can't do it by using somebody else's stuff. You got to be yourself and you got to use your stuff. Now, what do you mean by that? Use what's in your hands. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Do whatever your hand finds to do. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Your hand in this passage is your skill and your ability. I believe that the Bible talks about the work of your hands, and that is your skill and your ability and your gifting. The work of God's hand is the things he's done. Psalm 92, 4. Oh Lord, I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Isaiah 64, 8. Oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Uh, Acts 4, 30. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Listen to this. Your 
finding what your hand or doing what your hand finds to do is doing what your skill, what your skill set is, what you're called to do, what you're equipped to do. Be yourself and use what you have. If you're an artist, what do you paint with besides a paintbrush? You use your hands. If you're a barber, what do you cut hair with? You use your hands. If you're a musician, what do you play an instrument with? You use your hands. If you're a quarterback, what do you throw and what do you catch that football with? Your hands. Uh, if you're a driver, a plumber, a roofer, a woodworker, a computer programmer, or even a farmer, you use your hands. Your hands represent your skill set. So find out what your skill set is and then begin to use that for the glory of God. Whatever your hand finds to do, use it and do it with all your might. Now that word might, that is talking about not just uh, doing something that is your gifting. The word might talks about doing it with the intention of getting it done. So what your hand finds to do means what your skill set finds to do. Do it with all your might means to do it to full completion with the intention of fulfilling the thing that you're supposed to do. That's what you're called to do. Hallelujah. I remember doing a message one time called, If You're a Strummer, Strum. There was an old guy that played the guitar when I was a kid in church, and he was a strummer. The problem was he didn't know he was a strummer. He thought he was a picker. And so he was always trying to pick the songs. And so while we're up there singing these songs that are supposed to be beautiful, glorious, magnifying songs to the Lord, he was over there, bow, 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 bow trying to find the melody. Please stop. Don't do that. But whenever I saw him strumming, he could strum the chords. If you are a strummer, don't try to be a picker. If you're a picker, you don't have to worry about trying to be a strummer. Do what God has called you to do. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever your skill set is, do it with all your might. Do it to full completion. Hallelujah. There's a word in that for somebody who's watching this. When you do it like that, God will honor it. Amen. So your might means your strength, the power, the force, the ability to accomplish an action. Whatever you're good at, whatever your hand, hand finds to do, whatever you're good at, do it with all your might. Do it with the ability to comp accomplish it. Now listen to this. There's another word I want you to look at. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever your hand, your skill, your ability, your gifting, fines. Now, what does the fines have to do with? That has to do with your motivations and your desires, but not just any motivations. That has to do with the motivations that are sanctified after you've come to the Lord and he has set you apart. After your mind is being transformed, after you've taken off the old self and put on the new self and your desires are being renewed, then you try to find, that's where the motivation comes in. Whatever your skill, whatever your hand finds to do, that's your skill. Do it with all your might. You're going to do it to accomplish it, to completion. But that word finds, that's the desire. You can have skill, but not have desire. You can have skill to do things. I believe when the Lord gives you something to do to accomplish for him, he's going to give you the skill and the desire. You may have the skill, but you don't have the desire. And so you pray, Lord, if this is something you want me to do, give me the desire to do this. And you know, sometimes when you just get up and do it anyway, the desire will come later. But what's really dangerous is if you have the desire, but you don't have the skill. Lord, I really love to sing on the praise team at church. Can you carry a tune? No, but I'd really love to sing on the praise team at church. If you have the desire, but you don't have the skill, you need to do one of two things. You need to learn how to sing or you need to stay in the shower when you're singing. Amen? Because the acoustics are great and it'll make you sound like a star. And so the idea is do what your skill finds to do. In other words, it's your skill and your desire. And when you do that, it's you being you. It's you using what you have. And when you do that, the enemy can't stop you. It'll open doors from for you. And the enemy will not be able to sit you down and shut you up. Hallelujah. Skill and desire work together. Skill and desire work together. We have desire without skill. We have skill without desire. 
but when you find your own voice, be who you are, use what you have. Karen Carpenter tried to sing like everybody else sang and she didn't make it. But one day she found her own voice. She found her own pitch. She found her own key and the rest was history. She was a star. Johnny Cash did the same thing. He tried to sing at a different tempo. What was country music back then? What was popular? You know, pippy and peppy and hippy and hoppy. And then, and he was trying to do that. And then uh, one day he decided to just sing it using what he had and who he was. And he brought it down to a lower key. And he brought that tempo down. And he said, hear that train coming. Coming round the bend. Now that sounds more like Elvis trying to imitate Johnny Cash. But anyway, whenever he found his voice, the rest is musical history. And you know, thank the Lord he found Jesus too before it was over. Be yourself. To be yourself, you have to know yourself. Now in order to know, in order to be yourself, you've got to know yourself. But in order to know, let me say that again. In order to be yourself, you've got to know yourself. But in order to know yourself, you got to know God first. You know, I always get excited about these confessions about this is who I am and this is what I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the winner and not the loser. And, you know, da, 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 da. But, you know, before you do all those things, in order to know truly that you are those things, you've got to know who he is. You got to know who he is. Be yourself. But you have to know yourself. Know yourself. You have to know God first. Listen to this. In order to find out who you are, you got to find out who God is. In order to find out who you are, you got to find out who God is. Listen to this. Abram learned that God was his shield and his very great reward. Abram learned who God was, and then Abram knew who he was. He was Abraham, the father of the nations, the father of multitudes. Jacob had a divine encounter with, uh, with God. Jacob found out who God was, and then Jacob became Israel. He struggles with God and man and overcomes. Whenever his identity was found in God, his identity changed and he found out who he was. Hallelujah. It literally means God fights. Amen. Simon looked at Jesus and he had a revelation and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And when Simon acknowledged and found out who Jesus was, then Simon became Peter, the rock, because on the foundation of the faith and the confession of Peter, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on that confession that I'm the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. Rabbi Shaul, who was going around on the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with Yeshua HaMashiach. And whenever Rabbi Shaul found out who Jesus was, then his name became the Apostle Paul. So you find out who God is. You find out who the Lord is in your life and you'll find out who you are. When you find out who you are, you'll find out what it is you need to be doing. When you find out what you need to be doing, you're going to find out how you're going to be doing it. You're going to have desires that's going to help you find your skill set. Whatever your hand, your skill set finds to do, do it with all your might. Do it to completion. And when you do that, there's not a giant from the enemy's army that will ever be able to stop you because when you find your skill set, you'll be like David with the sling. You will be, you know, I can't put on Saul's armor. I can't wear Saul's armor. Saul's armor is too big for me. You're like, but you need something big. He's a big giant. Sometimes you got to be the little guy coming in. Don't let him see you coming. And that's how God used strategy in David's life to overcome the enemy. He took what David had. He used that sling. Whew, man, hallelujah. And when he found out who he was, what he could do because of the Lord, he found out who he was in the Lord. He was able to overcome that giant. Hallelujah. Be yourself. Use your stuff. Be who and what God has called you to be. Amen. Your ability, your desire, your motivation finds out what you want to do. And then you do that until you do it to complete fullness and completion. Amen. So I hope that you've learned something, but I've also, I also hope you've been motivated to go out 
and find out who you are. Because yeah, giants are real. Now, I don't know that we have any nine footers or 13 footers walking the earth today, but there are some spiritual giants. There are some emotional and mental giants. There are giants of stress. There are giants of worry. But if you will find out who God is, and then you'll know who you are in him, then you will be able to stand up and say, I come against you, not with a sword or a shield or a spear, but Satan, I come against you in the name of the Lord of the God of the armies of Israel. Hallelujah. And he will fight that battle and you'll see the enemy routed and defeated in Jesus name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, that hopefully we've learned something new about your word, but also learned how to take some things and put them into practice. Father, I pray that your word will not return void, but will come back and accomplish everything you send it forth to accomplish, Father. I ask this in the precious name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. Amen. To God be the glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace in the name of Jesus. God bless you and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.